Welcome to the Library of Congress this afternoon. My name is John Haskell. I'm the director of the Kluge Center. I, I do want to mention something about the, the noise has been the decibel level out in front of the Supreme Court. It's been fairly high at times, and it may be back. Uh, at, actually, I think it's appropriate with a discussion of the Declaration of Independence that's there some demonstrate. I mean, it's a Bill of Rights thing, maybe, but still. Uh, the Kluge Center is, uh, was created 20 years ago, and in the words of its charter, it was meant, quote, to reinvigorate the interconnection between thought and action through conversations and meetings with members of Congress, their staffs, and the broader policy-making community in order to bridge the divide between knowledge and power. On a day-to-day -day basis, this means that we at the Kluge Center support scholars doing innovative and specialized work at the Library of Congress and project scholarly work to a broader audience in events such as this one. Next week on November 21, in Coolidge Auditorium at 4 p.m., we have an event on 100 years of women voting. Colleen Shogan, assistant deputy librarian, will be interviewing Christina Wolbrecht from Notre Dame, who literally is writing the book on 100 years of women voting, and Jane Jun from the University of Southern California. Let me also draw your attention to a new series at the Library of Congress, which is to continue the National Book Festival so it's not just one weekend in a year at Labor Day, but now is during the year and, and we have an NBF, National Book Festival Presents series. We have one more event in this series. We've had several already this year, including Neil Patrick Harris on children's books, Karen Armstrong, a theologian, on her recent book, and tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, Andre Asiman will be here on the launch of his new book, which was just reviewed today in the Washington Post, Find Me, which is the sequel to his best-selling, Call Me By Your Name. Let's move to the program today. We're honored to have Danielle Allen with us. Let me tell you why. She is the James Conant, Bryant Conant University professor at Harvard University and director of Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics and is a political theorist who has published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought. Allen is also the principal investigator for the Demo Democratic Knowledge Project, a distributed research and action lab at Harvard. The Democratic Knowledge Project seeks to identify, strengthen, and disseminate the bodies of knowledge, skills, and capacities that democratic citizens need in order to succeed at operating their democracy. The lab currently has three projects underway, the Declaration Resources Project, the Humanities and Liberal Arts Assessment Project, and the Youth and Participatory Politics Action and Reflection Frame. She's here today with Colleen Shogan, who, as I said, is the Assistant Deputy Librarian for Collections and Services here at the library. Colleen is also Dr. Carla Hayden's designee on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and serves as Vice Chair of the Commission. When this program is over, we will be taking questions in the last 15 minutes or so. Then uh, Danielle will be uh, signing books next door, her, her most recent book. Please join me in welcoming Colleen and Danielle. Thank you, John. Uh, what an honor to have you here today talking about the Declaration. To start us off, tell us the story of how you, you came to write a book on the Declaration of Independence. Sure, well, it's a slightly embarrassing story <laughs> at some level, um, but it comes out of the best teaching experience I've ever had. That part's not embarrassing. I'll get to the embarrassing part in a minute. Um, I taught at the University of Chicago for 10 years, and while I was there, I was incredibly lucky to get involved in something called the Clemente Program of the Humanities, which was a year-long course of the humanities for low-income adults. So people often who hadn't finished their high school degree or maybe had started college but had dropped out and were ready now at this point in their lives to start again and try to reconnect to the educational system. And the program was very ambitious. The goal was to give the Knight students the same quality of education that we delivered to University of Chicago students during the day. Um, but we were talking about working adults, um, adults often juggling childcare, health complications, um, and I said, as I said, some people who didn't necessarily have a high school degree. So there's a kind of a riddle to be solved. How do you deliver the same quality of education um, to Knight students in these circumstances as you do to the University of Chicago students? And the solution to the riddle um, was that you teach exactly the same caliber of material, you just teach short texts. 
shorter versions of things, or you just pick short texts rather than long, long novels, but great language, great ideas, et cetera, same quality of material. So how I came to teach the Declaration of Independence, and this is the embarrassing part, is just that it's very short. <laughs> that was my total and complete motivation for selecting the Declaration of Independence for this program, where we were teaching US history, philosophy, literature, writing, and art history. Um, but once I selected it, it was just immediately obvious how powerful it was as a teaching text, not just because of its historical role, but for teaching philosophy, for teaching writing, and then the most incredible thing for me was just the way in which my night students um, got to the heart of the text a lot faster than any of my day students ever had. So, and that's a very basic thing. I mean, if you think about the Declaration, it is a group of people who have looked around their world. They say, you know, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. They have diagnosed their circumstances and they have decided on a change. Right, like the voices outside right, right. that we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And then they've said, here's the direction we're going to go. We're going to change our circumstances. We're going to declare independence. Here are our reasons. My night students were all people who were in the middle of trying to change their lives. So they got the text immediately. Whereas sort of day students who were kind of like working their way through, oh, is it about the Stamp Act? Is it about the Sugar Act? Is it about the town? I'm like, no, it's about human agency, people. Like, that's what the story is fundamentally about. Um, and so my night students really opened up the text for me. And my motivation in writing the book was to try to recapture um, the, the conversations we had had with each other as we opened this text up together. Why do you think that all Americans should read the Declaration slowly and carefully? So again, I mean, I just you know, the Declaration is this incredible text. It's 1,337 words, and as Lincoln said about it, it established the proposition that all people are created equal, and it, it erected a new system of government on the basis of that proposition. But the thing that's so interesting to me about the text is that it actually, in itself, makes the case that all you need to know to understand what democracy is, is in this text. Right, so in other words, the human equality that we have is that the argument this text makes about human agency is accessible to all of us. All right? And so reading or listening, it doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make here is that every American, as a part of activating the equality that brings us together as democratic citizens, um, can understand the purpose of democracy by engaging with this text. So that's why I think it's so important, because it's, its brevity rests on its own claim about equality. All right, That is, it's brief as a part of being accessible. And its accessibility is underscoring the fact that human beings know what agency is, right? Day after day, every human being is trying to make tomorrow better than today. That's what human agency is. It's just that effort, the engagement of our spirits in making our world better tomorrow than it was yesterday. And that's what this text is about. Um, and so I believe it was constructed in order to help people really focus in on that kernel story of human agency and what its implications are for the political systems that we build. Is Thomas Jefferson the author of the Declaration? So, you know, you know my views on that subject. Um, <laughs> so I like to say, you know, here's a secret, okay? Uh, if you want credit for something, Okay, remember this. Think about what is it in your world that you want credit for? Everybody got it? What's the thing you want credit for? Okay. Put it on your tombstone. <laughs> okay? Because his tombstone says, author, Declaration of Independence. And that is really why we think Thomas Jefferson is the author of the Declaration of Independence. That is the fundamental reason. Because what actually was the case is that he was the chair of a committee. So he did absolutely get credit for being the person responsible for drafting the first draft that went to Congress. Congress then revised it. But as he was drafting it, he worked very closely with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, and they made direct edits on the text. Um, Adams was the real generator of some of the key ideas in the text, and we actually can see that not just because he you know, wrote treatises in 1776 arguing that happiness was the core principle that they should use to think about their political efforts, he also wrote a text for Massachusetts in January of 1776, which is a rough draft for the Declaration of Independence. Um, and there are other pieces of this kind. So Jefferson was um, young and not super important. 
and Adams was really, really, really busy. That's right? an important thing to know about the spring of 1776. Adams was on like every committee in Continental Congress, basically. Jefferson had time on his hands. Um, when they decided to move the resolution for independence forward, they, before they actually took a vote on independence, they set up a committee to draft the statement justifying it. And when they set up committees to write the preambles to go with resolutions in Congress, um, they always did it by vote, and whoever got the most votes would chair the committee to do this. Um, as I said, Adams was really busy. He did not have time to draft a Declaration of Independence, okay? Um, but he liked how Jefferson wrote, so he worked the hustings behind the scenes and got Jefferson elected chair. So Jefferson won the vote by one. Adams came in second right behind him, then Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. So they were the committee of five that worked together to draft the declaration. Congress then cut out 25% before finally voting on it and approving the July 4th version that we all now know. Now, was the writing complete on July 4th, 1776, or did the declaration change? So that's a great question, and I love to think of the declaration as a living document. Um, and with all the, it's incredible how many voices are in the declaration. So when you read the text as we sort of standardly read it, you're hearing some of Jefferson's voice, you're hearing some of John Adams' voice. And it's really important to say that Adams never owned slaves, thought enslavement was a terrible thing, and was working against enslavement. So you actually hear the voice of an anti-slavery position in the Declaration, and I would be glad to talk more about that. Um, but in addition to that, there's the question of how was the text made public? Who made it public? And how did they add their voice to the story of the text? And you have John Dunlap, who printed it first officially for Congress um, immediately. Um, and then you have somebody named Timothy Matlack, who was this kind of, this is sort of an oxymoron, like rabble-rousing Quaker. Like, that's not supposed to go together. But apparently he was a rabble-rousing Quaker. He's a Quaker who got into fights and like, liked cockfighting. So how do these things go together? Who knows? But he also had very elegant calligraphy, and he was the person whom Congress engaged to uh, produce this, sadly now no longer legible to us. Um, and he um, was ca capitalized in a really important place in the document, the word we. He capitalized we. It hadn't been capitalized in any of the previous versions. And he was really a Democrat. He participated in Pennsylvania's Constitutional Convention. He really advocated for the democratic structure of that constitution in particular, which was a more directly democratic constitution than some of the other states were adopting. And I believe in that moment he was sharing his voice. He was putting himself in the document um, alongside the voices of the others. Uh, Mary Catherine Goddard, a printer, is another person whose voice I like to point out. She was given the first commission uh, by Congress to produce one broadside, a poster version of the declaration for each state capital. And so in January of 1777, she produced these poster versions. And in her version, uh, all the words for God are in all caps. So creators in all caps, and supreme judge, and divine providence. And so she, it would appear, or her print shop, wanted to emphasize the religiosity in the document. But that also underscores the fact that it hadn't been emphasized by other people. Right? So you have very different ways of thinking about the document and its words and its arguments across the colonies and in the different voices of people who participated in sharing it with the public. Okay, so we're going to uh, uh, try something different. Uh, we're going to actually read the first two sentences of the Declaration and engage in a close reading like you do in your book. And we're just going to go back and forth and try to tease out some of the meaning. So the, for the first sentence, um, you make the point that the Declaration of Independence is basically a memo. Yep. So t talk a little bit about that. This is the first sentence in a memo. Yep. So a memo comes from the Latin word uh, memorandum, which is a thing that must be remembered. All right. And so we use that word for all the work that we do in offices and bureaucracies and so forth because Human social organization depends on our developing things that we remember together, shared memories, right? So we always talk about you know, after a phone call, let's memorialize that conversation we just had so we both remember the next steps. And so a memo is the basic instrument human beings use for coordinating action, all right? It means it is a document, the purpose of which is to develop shared purpose and shared steps to take together and that's what the Declaration is. They were making a decision together. They were 
um, declaring their independence from Britain and their rights as sovereign states to form treaties and operate a military and so forth. Um, and in addition to memorializing this decision, they wanted to explain it. Um, so this was a memo uh, that they distributed internally to the military and then to foreign governments to explain and make memorable and remembered the action steps they were choosing. Okay. Now, when I write a memo, I don't usually appeal to the course of human events. And, and maybe I should. Maybe I should start <laughs> doing that. You should try. It's a lot yeah. of fun. I do it, actually. It's really, you know, it's, it always makes me laugh when I stick that into a memo. Uh, tell us about, about that phrase. When in, why is that the beginning of the declaration? Yeah, why do they make that appeal? Phrase. So if you spend time, so I'm, I'm lucky to have, um, you know, slightly eccentric parents. We all have eccentric <laughs> parents, right? We all think of our parents as eccentric. And... Um, my mother um, is a rare books librarian, and her, one of her passions in life is for early American almanacs, which were, other than the Bible, those were the two books that were most common in colonial America in people's homes. And an almanac is this great thing, which my favorite feature of it is that it predicts the weather for the entire year. <laughs> right, like you're in January, it's like November 13th, it's going to rain. Anyway, I just love that kind of bizarre self-confidence. Um, so almanacs are a lovely way to learn about the culture of um, early America because of all the visual stuff that are in them, all etchings and engravings and things like that. And when I was working on this book and using the kind of visual material from those almanacs to give myself more of an immediate sense of the time and the place and the culture, I was struck just by how often there were images of rivers and waters with ships sailing on them that they were using to talk about the experience of trying to navigate challenges or see their way to the future. And as I was looking at those images, I realized that's what's in that phrase, course of human events. It's the um, image or metaphor of a river um, in that phrase. And in that simple word, you get a kind of beautiful rendering of the challenge of human life that the river has currents that are unpredictable and tricky. There's a place you're trying to go, but it's not completely within your control. Uh, but your job in sort of steering your personal ship or the ship of your community, co-steering it with others, is to try to figure out how to navigate this course. Um, and so the, right from the get-go, with that just little beautiful implicit image of a river in the word course, um, you know that you're starting into a story of human agency and the kinds of decisions human mean, beings make about where they find themselves. When you do, uh, when you read the Declaration slowly and carefully, as you suggest people should, some phrases really stick out in the, in the first sentence. The first one that stuck out for me was one people. Mm. That's pretty revolutionary that the colonists at this point in time are referring to themselves as one people, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yes. I mean, this is an assertion. Mm -hmm. This is an, a moment of creation. There would be plenty of people who would say that at this point in 1776, they hadn't yet come to understand themselves as one people. You can see this in the records from Continental Congress where they refer to their country, their home country, Virginia, their home country, Massachusetts. Um, they had by now been meeting together in Continental Congress since 1774, so for two years. But that's how new the notion was that they would be doing something together. And even across the breadth of the colonies, the, yes, lots of English immigration, yes, lots of different sort of streams of Christianity, there was some sense of something shared, but there was also a lot of heterogeneity. Um, there was religious diversity. Rhode Island had a really significant um, Jewish community. Pennsylvania, of course, had a very significant German community. Um, so languages were complicated, the Dutch in New York and so forth. So there was by no means a sense of there being cultural homogeneity. And Bernard Balin's, I think, most recent book, A Barbarous People, is really excellent account of the range of diversity um, in the colonies. Um, but what they were coming to understand was that the project of self-government, um, of building a world where people can be free and equal citizens, depends first on the creation of a people, a group of people who will mutually commit to that project of self-government. Um, and so they are, in this moment, in the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, um, asserting that they are making this thing a people. It's the first thing they make is a people. The other phrase that really stood out for me was separate and equal. Mm. And that really makes you pause because you don't think separate and equal, you think separate but equal. So talk yeah. about how segregationists in the language of Plessy really took this language and adopted it for 
really means very opposed to what the declaration stands for. Yeah, and that's a really important question. Yes, I mean, this phrase, separate and equal station, I think does give birth to the language of separate but equal that developed post Plessy v. Ferguson to explain segregation and Jim Crow. So to understand that, you have to dig into what the phrase means. And what it really is doing is giving us our first concept of equality in the Declaration, okay? It's the first time the word equal appears. And this first concept of equality is about the equality between different sovereign states. Um, it comes out of the tradition, legal tradition, um, of European state sovereignty from the Westphalian Treaty, as people talk about it. So the notion that once you have a sovereign state, no other sovereign state can interfere with anything in the territory of that first sovereign state. Philosophers describe this as an idea that you know, France can't dominate Spain, can't interfere with each other. England can't interfere with Austria-Hungary, et cetera. Um, so you have this sense of agency, a sphere of agency controlled by sovereign states. It's important that that sphere of agency, which sovereign states have in relationship to each other, is also the model for the sphere of agency that citizens in a self-governing society have to have with each other. Every person needs a sphere of agency such that they cannot be dominated by any other person, and it's the job of the rule of law to secure that. So in other words, as citizens, we are supposed to be separate and equal. We're supposed to be protected from each other by the rule of law and equal, have equal standing within our polity as participants in our decision-making processes. So what happens exactly to get from separate and equal as a kind of positive statement about citizenship to separate but equal? Um, this is obviously the long, hard, complicated story of American history, and I want to call out two moments in it to make sense of that transition. Um, the first relates to Jefferson, actually. This is something I've come to understand more recently, sort of since writing the book. Lots of people really wrestle with the question of how could Jefferson be even chair of a committee that drafted this? You know, I won't say author, but, but he's chair of a committee that drafted this you know, great language we have about equality in the Declaration and also have been an enslaver, an, an owner of enslaved people. How can these things fit together? And especially people ask this question when they look at the whole draft that Jefferson generated, which includes a paragraph condemning the slave trade. And when he condemns the slave trade, he calls it cruel, and he describes it as a violation of the sacred rights of life and liberty of a distant people in Africa. And that vocabulary of sacred rights of life and liberty is exactly the same as the vocabulary he uses to talk about the colonists themselves with their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in fact, in one of his early drafts, he'd even used the word sacred to talk about those rights for colonists. So in his first draft, Jefferson lays out the notion that people from Africa, people from Europe have the same sacred rights of life and liberty. So you know, what gives then with this guy who is an enslaver, um, holds people as property, and so on? Um, and what it all comes out to ultimately is that Jefferson did actually um, think that there was a general uh, set of human rights that all people had access to. He did not believe in the capacity of white and black to build worlds together. So Jefferson, actually, and this is, comes out in later of his writings, um, does have a vision where people in Africa might well build their own self-governing societies, and white people in the US would build theirs. And there's a separate but equal idea that comes out of Jefferson's writing about race. So that's the sort of first thing to say. But then there's the second moment, which is, of course, when the Confederacy um, appears on the scene and takes the question of racial supremacy and wants to make it the heart of a political project. So people often don't know that the um, Confederacy, in setting itself up, um, its leadership believed that they needed to rewrite the Declaration of Independence. Right? That they needed their own Declaration of Independence. And Alexander Stevens was the person who drafted this. And he says about it, you know, first of all, the language of it says that um, you know, the, the white race and the black race are not equal, that the white race is superior to the Negro race. And he describes the Declaration as being the first ever to, to found a government on the truth that white is superior to black. So the point is that the Confederacy understood that the Declaration focused on equality and self-consciously thought that they had to replace that with an inegalitarian um, statement of purpose as a part of launching the Confederacy. Um, and so that tradition then um, sort of hooks up with the sort of Jeffersonian approach and ends up generating our separate but equal concept um, that 
operated in segregation and Jim Crow. That was a very long-winded answer. I apologize, but I hope those pieces fit together and made some sense. So. Okay, one more question before we move on to the second sentence. Why is it the laws of nature and nature's God? Why both? Yes. No, I like to talk about that phrase as the belt and suspenders moment in the Declaration, <laughs> right? Um, so the, the Declaration is a marvel for many reasons. One of the reasons is the way in which it has compromises in it. Um, there's a good compromise and a bad compromise. The bad compromise has to do with slavery, and I've told you about pieces of it. I haven't told you the whole picture yet. Um, the good compromise was about religion, where there was an effort to achieve a text that people could sign on to regardless of whether or not they were believers or not believers, deists or even atheists. And if they were believers, regardless of what kind of doctrine of belief they had. So none of the religious language in the Declaration has any doctrinal connection. So it's all open-ended. Uh, nature's God, supreme judge, divine providence. It's not Christian, it's not Jewish, it's not Muslim. You can't name it as any particular doctrine or no sect of Christianity. Um, but it was also the case that there were people who weren't believers participating in the development of the Declaration. And for them, the question of, well, what justifies this picture of human beings? The answer is laws of nature. So we have a picture of how nature operates and what human beings are, in some sense, in their essence. And that suffices. You don't need a divine guarantee in order to explain the moral basis of the Declaration. So you get this sort of great belt and suspenders phrase, as I say, where you know what, what explains this uh, concept of human beings building their own sovereign states together? Well, the laws of nature and nature's God. Right? You can pick either justification you'd like um, to move forward in adopting these ideals. So you can give it a religious basis or you can give it a secular basis, either way. That's the compromise um, that they achieved as a part of finding a way to move forward together. Okay, we're going to move on to the second sentence. Now, if you thought the first sentence was complex, the second sentence is really complicated. Um, you're going to have to talk us through this. So let's start with the big picture. Tell us about the structure of this sentence. How many claims are in it? Talk us through that. Well, we always have to start by reading it out loud or reciting it out loud, if you're like me. So that's, I always give people the homework assignment. I always say, this is the one you go away and memorize this <laughs> sentence. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. And then I always like to say, did you remember that it was that long? <laughs> you guys are here at the Library of Congress, so you might well have remembered that it was this long. But most people don't realize that this sentence is this long. And there's a long story about why that's the case. But let me, for the moment, just answer your question, which is that this beautifully crafted sentence is what philosophers would call a syllogism. And my favorite example of a syllogism is always, a syllogism sort of has two premises and a conclusion that's logically entailed by the premises. So for example, um, all human beings die, Bill Gates is human, Bill Gates will die, <laughs> all right? And there's supposed to be a charge around that conclusion because we so lionize Bill Gates that we forget he's going to die just like the rest of us. Like he's no better than, we're all going to die. It's just, Bill Gates is exactly the same as me in that regard. But the premises, because we, we forget that feature of, of Bill Gates, the premises necessitate it. And then the conclusion feels as if it's showing us something that we had forgotten about or hadn't seen. And in the 18th century, actually, in logic handbooks, uh, this is the definition of self-evidence. Okay? Self-evidence is a conclusion that follows logically from its premises. So that's what this sentence is doing. It's giving us a set of premises that logically lead to the conclusion. What are the premises? People have rights. Premise one. Premise two, people institute government to secure those rights. All right? Then there's a 
left out premise implicit that if you that you have a right to whatever you need to secure the things you have rights to. But then the conclusion is if the government's not securing the rights the way it's supposed to do, you have the right to alter or abolish it. Okay, so humans have rights, people have rights, we build governments to secure rights. Conclusion, if government's not doing its job, we get to change the government. Okay? It's gorgeous. It's a very compact, efficient theory of revolution. So philosophers in the 18th century are kind of competing over people's theories of revolution. So this one kind of wins for shortest, shortest, most compact theory of revolution. But beyond that, um, what it is is really an account of the basis for self-government, namely, again, that human beings have rights. We can sort of talk more about what that means and that we human beings work together to build governments to secure those rights so that the fundamental sort of feature of human agency that I started out by talking about um, is then captured in the last clause. Um, people have to diagnose whether the government is securing their rights, and then if it isn't, it's their job to alter it. Right within there being two jobs, to, two pieces to that job of alteration, lay the foundation on principles, and organize the powers of government. So there's like a two-part task list for thinking about what it means to be a civic actor. Uh, principles and organize the powers of government. So the structure, it's a syllogism, two premises, a missing one, and then the conclusion um, to deliver an argument about um, just forms of government and the consent of the people. So we talked a little bit about self-evident. Let's talk about the phrase, um, all men. And you have a particular interpretation of who that includes. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? And then you use the declaration to answer that question. Sure. So it's really um, important to recognize the, how the language worked at the time, and also to acknowledge that language works differently now for us. So the word men here was an example of the general universal usage of men to capture human beings. And we know that Jefferson used the word this way because later in his draft, he does the same thing. So in the same passage I mentioned about the condemnation of the slave trade, he condemns slave markets where men, and he writes it in all caps, are bought and sold. And we know that in slave markets, women and children were also bought and sold. There's no sense in which that use of the word men was supposed to mean only males. Um, and it's exactly the same here, that the word um, is being used to capture all human beings. That said, that doesn't um, excuse or do away with the fact that they also chose to organize the powers of government um, through a patriarchal structure of political organization. So the principles were ones that they did actually mean with a universal conception of human beings. But when it came time to talk about how to organize the powers of government, that they were very explicit about restricting to men. And in the language of John Adams, um, when Abigail Adams pushed him to say, what about the women? Where do we fit in all of this? Um, his answer was that the principles, rights of life and liberty and happiness, that's for you too, that's for everybody. But in terms of how that gets delivered, that's the job of men. And we're not going to give up, in his phrase, our masculine system of government for delivering on those rights. So that final clause that distinguishes between the principles that everything is grounded on and how the powers of government are organized, that's how they split their thinking, right? So they really did actually think the principles captured all human beings, but then they had the patriarchal and race-based conception of how to organize the powers of government. That's where the problem came in. We see the second usage of the word uh, equal uh, in this sentence. In what sense is equal used differently or have a, a separate meaning than what we saw in the first sentence? Great, no thank you, that's a great question. So the first sentence I really pointed out the concept of these spheres of agency that are left untouched by others, um, free from domination um, by others. Um, this um, passage gets to something different. It gets to what I like to describe as basic human moral equality. So you might think that first concept of being a kind of political equality that I was trying to name. And now this gets to a basic human moral equality where it really focuses on the thing that um, puts us on an equal footing with each other. And that is just that kernel of agency I described at the very beginning. The fact that every human being is trying to make tomorrow better than today or better than yesterday. Each of us, in our way, is pursuing happiness, some improvement in well-being or welfare. 
And then in order to do that, to act on that, we need protections for life and liberty that make it possible for us to act on that um, kernel of agency that we have. Uh, but the other really important thing in this sentence that gets to this concept of human equality um, is the notion that human beings make judgments for themselves about their safety and happiness, okay? And the declaration rests on this really quite stunning idea that for each and every one of us, there is no human being other than ourselves who's better positioned than we are ourselves to make judgments about our future happiness. Did you follow that? That was an abstract formulation. So in other words, it's true that none of us are really that good at figuring out our own happiness, okay? Like we have to admit that, like we're mostly pretty bad at figuring out our own happiness. But even though we're not that great, any of us, at figuring out our own happiness, there's not a single human being out there who's better positioned than I am myself to figure that out for myself. Because no other human being has access to what I know about my aspirations, about my capacities, about my commitments and my loves and my passions. Nobody else has access to all of that. And as a consequence, no other human being can answer the question of what my path to happiness is. And so there's a sort of staggering recognition of actually weirdly like the isolation of human beings in their responsibility for their own path to happiness. But in that isolation that we have is also where our individual empowerment and agency reside and our equality to one another. Like, you, you can't tell me what my path to happiness is because you, you don't got the goods to know. All right, but that puts responsibility on me. I've got to answer that question myself because I'm the only one who's got the goods to figure that out for myself. But then once you recognize that about human beings, it's kind of really a deep point. It really raises the question then about how do we then build collective structures and do political work together once we recognize that none of us actually really has got the goods to tell anybody else what to do. And happiness is a really deliberate part of, the, of this sentence. It appears twice, actually. And instead, we know that the drafters had read Locke, and, and they, 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 they thought of life, liberty, and Locke wrote about life, liberty, and property. Mm -hmm. He did not write about life, liberty, and happiness. So there's a yep. deliberate insertion of happiness twice, yep. as basically, as you said, to the end of government, right? Yep, exactly. OK, so my other homework assignment for you. <laughs> that part of it, that's John Adams not Thomas Jefferson, okay? And I'm about to tell you why it's really, really important, but please take away the idea that John Adams was as much an intellectual architect for this as Thomas Jefferson was. It's a hugely important part of the story of the Declaration. So first, it's worth noticing that the phrase moves from I to we. My rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to their, our safety and happiness. So this move from rights that we have to governments we institute together results in our securing together our safety and happiness. And it makes the fundamental point about democracy that its difficulty is in this movement from I to we, this conversion of what's my conception of what I need in mind to some collective picture. Okay, so it's focusing ourselves on the difficulty. Well, what about this word happiness itself? Why does it show up here? So life, liberty, and property was the more common formulation. But in the fall of 1775, Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore, declared that any enslaved person who escaped a plantation to fight for the British would secure their freedom. They would be granted freedom um, by England. And this was what radicalized the Virginians to participate in the revolution. So, it's the bad news part of the story, right? Virginia really was radicalized to commit to independence by a threat to the slavery system. Um, and at the point of their radicalization, they started complaining that King George, through Lord Dunmore with this decree, had violated their rights to property. And from the fall of 1775, the defense of the right to property became very closely connected to a defense of slavery, okay? So by the spring of 1776, they were debating the question of how to explain what the thing was that they were embarked on together, but property had become linked with slavery. 
John Adams is the one who starts writing that the concept they should focus on is happiness. He publishes a pamphlet called Some Thoughts Concerning Government in April of 1776, where he argues that just as the end of individual men is happiness, so too is the end of government happiness. And he draws on a tradition of Aristotle and theologians and so forth to call out the concept of happiness as the one they should, they should prioritize. And we can see the debate about these two terms happening through the course of the spring. So for example, in May, when George Mason drafts Virginia's Declaration of Rights, he uses both phrases. He talks about rights to acquiring and securing property and also to pursuing happiness. He puts them on an equal footing. So what's happening is there's clearly a debate which concept, property or happiness, should be used as the ends of government. And in the period from May through the drafting in June, amongst this committee on five, happiness wins. In other words, Adams wins. Jefferson has not used this vocabulary previously. This is Adams' vocabulary all the way through. Um, and it is a moment that is basically an anti-slavery moment in the Declaration. So Congress takes out the passage condemning the slave trade. That's a pro-slavery moment. And Congress does this, but this phrase, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, displaces property, and that's an anti-slavery moment. Um, so that's the second compromise. The first one I described was one about religion. This is the second compromise in the Declaration. And we know that people recognized it as an anti-slavery moment because the people who first made use of the Declaration and made use of this sentence um, were abolitionists. So as of January of 1777, Prince Hall, who was a free African American in Boston, used vocabulary from this sentence in the Declaration to put a petition to the Massachusetts Assembly for the end of slavery. Um, and slavery was ended in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Vermont by in the year 1780 to 83, flowing directly out of sort of crystallization of commitments and alliances around the vocabulary from this sentence in the Declaration. One last question before we move on from our close reading. Why is it important that on the first uh, mention of happiness that there is a comma after mm -hmm. uh, that word rather than a period? All right, so you're going to get to my, like, you know, be in my bonnet subject. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this, I'm so happy to have this beautiful complete sentence on this screen because this is how Thomas Jefferson wrote it in his drafts. When John Adams copied out the draft, this is how he wrote it. When Charles Thompson, the Secretary for Congress, inscribed the Declaration in the minute books for Congress, this is how he wrote it. When John Dunlap, the first official printer for Congress, printed it, this is how he printed it. But there was a man in Philadelphia named Benjamin Town who was a kind of get-rich newspaper publisher, where his basic approach to getting rich was to publish faster than anybody else and more frequently. So he would publish his new newspaper roughly three times a week, where most people were publishing once a week at that point. And somehow, and we still do not know how, somebody slipped him a copy of the Declaration before it had even gotten to Congress's official printer, John Dunlap. So, Town came out with a version in his newspaper before Dunlap got the official version into his paper two days later. And Town apparently thought that this sentence was pretty long, and he put a period after the pursuit of happiness. Okay, and so now, then the story gets very, very complicated. But if you go to the National Archives website, for example, the transcription of the sentence has a period after pursuit of happiness. And why does this matter? I was in Philadelphia, some number of years ago, watching an exhibit about independence, watching some kids go through, and they were looking at a text of the Declaration that had a period after pursuit of happiness. And a group of four or five teenagers gathered around, and they all read it out, they started reading it, and they got to pursuit of happiness, and they stomped their feet and stopped reading and walked off, because there was a period there. They stopped reading. So what does that mean? For them, the self-evident truths consists of the individual rights, and that's all. Whereas the self-evident truths are the story of the fact that we collectively build government together to protect our rights, and then finally have the job of changing our government if it's not securing our rights. So they miss the entire story. They don't get the move from I to we. They get a very libertarian picture of what rights are about. They're just about my rights. They don't get the story about what we do together to secure our rights as a people working together. 
And it's really thanks to Benjamin Town. His newspaper circulated to about half the colonies, more in a southerly direction. John Dunlap's correct version circulated more in a northerly direction as it happens. So these sort of accidents of history. And then the challenge is, um, I'm engaged in a, a big, ongoing, long-term fight will probably last my whole life with the National Archives. <laughs> because if we go back to the first, can we go back to the first oh, yes. slide? All right. See, the problem is, OK, this is the thing that was signed. All right? Now, if you try to transcribe that, can you? You cannot. So what has the National Archives done instead? They've transcribed the 1823 stone engraving, OK? And now they acknowledge that. That's on their website. I've, got, I've gotten that far in my fight, that now their website says that the transcription they have of there is the 1823 stone engraving, not this text. But the trouble is that the stone engraving put a period after pursuit of happiness, all right? Because lots of versions did following town. But the other trouble is that people for a very, very long time have thought the stone engraving was a perfect copy of the original. It's not, okay? My team has found four punctuation discrepancies, not even counting this one, and a bunch of other discrepancies in the document. But because everybody thinks the stone engraving is a perfect copy, they transcribe the declaration with a period after pursuit of happiness. And that's the number one version of the text that you will find if you search for it online. Um, that said, if you read the books of scholars about the declaration, Pauline Mayer, for example, down the line of scholars, all the way back to Carl Becker, you always get the complete sentence. So scholars have been clear on what the text is for a very, very long time. Um, but we have, it's very difficult to convince people that the stone of en engraving is not the right thing to use for a transcription. My recommendation would be that we use the text as recorded in the minutes of Congress as the text. That's my recommendation, <laughs> so <laughs> passing it on. But there you go, that's my oh. So the other uh, <laughs> argument you have in your book, uh, really quickly here, briefly, is a normative one in which you want to restore the role of equality in the Declaration. Mm -hmm. So tell us why freedom requires equality and why um, equality is, preempts freedom. Can we go back to the second sentence? The second okay, sentence, sorry. Got yeah. It. Just so we can have it in front of us. Um, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty basic idea. Um, so when people have thought about self-government um, in antiquity, so Greece and Rome, and then in the 18th century, um, a, a very common phrase to use to, think, to talk about self-government was to refer to um, a society of free and equal citizens. And for a lot of the history of political philosophy, freedom and equality were understood as going hand in glove together. And this is pretty straightforward at the end of the day. Um, if what you mean in the idea that you're building a society where people will be free is that everybody will be free, the only way that you can have freedom for everybody is if nobody dominates anybody else. And to say that you live in a world where nobody dominates anybody else is to say that you live in a world where people are equal to each other. So you can only have freedom for all if people have equality in relationship to each other. Now the equality that I am capturing there with that idea is very specifically political equality. Okay? The notion that everybody has to have political rights to participate, to be a co-creator of political um, institutions and of laws and so forth at the same time that they have personal freedoms and private liberties. Um, so this concept of political equality is one that was central to how the people who drafted the Declaration and the Constitution thought about what freedom is. Um, since that time, um, we've gone through sort of complicated arguments and debates about things like communism and economic egalitarianism, and that has shifted people's intuitive understanding of what equality is, so that now if you invoke the concept of equality, people will think in the first instance you might mean equal distribution of material goods, for example. Now that is something that is in conflict with the concept of freedom. Um, it requires a lot of sort of uh, legal structuring and so forth to um, achieve a perfect distribution of material um, goods. But that is not the only way to think about equality. Equality is basic. There's a sort of moral dimension, as I mentioned. You can talk about political equality. You can talk about social equality. Um, I think we should talk about economic egalitarianism, but that's a different thing from strict material equality and so forth. So the important, the really important point, though, 
is that if you have a democracy, you have to have it resting on two ideals linked together, freedom and equality, understood both as human moral equality and political equality. And when those things are linked together, then you have the question of what else do you need to support um, a structure of free and equal citizenship and free institutions. And then I think that's where questions come in about economics. And I do think, um, as many have over time argued, that you need a strong middle class economy. You do need egalitarian economic outcomes in order to support political equality. Um, but you end up then seeing a different way of putting the pieces and parts together for the concepts of freedom and equality if you start by focusing on how freedom and political equality are very, very tightly linked to each other. Did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, and, and this will be our last question before we go to the audience, but a lot of people are worried or concerned about widening gulfs of inequality in the United States today in a number of respects. How can the Declaration help us address these problems or try to solve some of these problems that present themselves? So it's, um, it, it, there's a lot to say about that. Um, let me just try to think, which, which of the many things I might say do I want to say? Um, I mean, I, wanna, I do want to say out loud that I'm glad that we're hearing the sort of DACA protests today because 11 million people without rights to citizenship who have lived in this country and function productively as parts of our community. That is basically the kind of situation of lack of access to political power that the colonists felt themselves to be experiencing in relationship to England. And so we have to recognize the basic kind of human symmetry of that. Um, and I think my own view is from within our traditions, we have to be responsive to that um, and acknowledge um, the need for securing of rights that um, DACA um, young people have. Um, so I just want to say that out loud. I think that their story actually is a lot like what our story was. Um, and we, none of us should want to live in a society that, from my point of view, we shouldn't want to live in a society that has um, 11 million people with no access to political equality. Um, that's a sort of um, violation of the principles about human rights um, that we ourselves articulated in the very beginning. That's a separate question from the question of what it means to have a border and force a border. This is not an open borders argument. You can separate those two things, okay? But I won't go into that now. That's a long, complicated conversation. Um, but then the other thing to say is, I always think it's really important to point out um, the job that this text assigns to citizens, laying the foundation on principles and organizing the powers of government and rethinking that over time. If you look closely, right, go back to the first clause we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and alienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Have you guys notice? It's not a complete list, mm -hmm. right? It's some examples. Mm -hmm. Among these, have some examples. People, get your thinking juices going. And then that means the question is to us, what do we think of as the basic rights that we ought to be securing? And there, obviously, we're having a really big conversation about health. Does health belong on this list of rights? I think it is something that we should be um, thinking about. But then the last thing I will say is that um, what this um, document does is make the case that in order to build um, a society of free and equal self-governing citizens, um, you really have to understand how you organize the powers of government. And that has to be working and workable in order for citizens to have the kind of agency the Declaration promises. Our institutions are obviously not functioning. Okay, I mean, you, know, you guys like sit here in Washington and you live in Washington, so uh, you know, I don't know what your relationship is to you, the, everything around here, but for the rest of us who aren't in DC, we're like, it's just not working people, okay? Like, it's just broken, we all know that. It's like, the basic thing everybody knows. And, I think we don't need to know anything else other than that. You know, Congress's approval rating hit 9% in, I think it was 2010, and then it was like 11%, it's about 20% now, but despite everybody's vocabulary about co-equal branches of government, the legislature is the first branch. It is Article I for a reason, because it is the branch responsible for articulating the will of the people. If your first branch has an approval rating of at best 20% and down to 9%, it's broken. It's just broken. And there's lots of reasons we could talk about why it's broken and how and so forth, but the fact of the matter is 
we do actually need to address it. And it's like we who have to address it, we the people, not any particular politician. So from my point of view, any single person running for office should have as their absolutely first policy domain, democracy policy or democracy agenda. How do we actually reorganize the institutions of government? Increase the size of the house, in congressional elections, have ranked choice voting in multi-member districts, complete the spread to all 50 states of independent, nonpartisan or bipartisan redistricting commissions. That's a starter set that would make a tremendous difference for the functioning of our institutions. But the point I'm really making is democracy itself should be a policy area at the top of our policy agenda. It should come before economic policy. It should come before healthcare. It should even come before climate. When you're sort of going through what are the list of sort of top priority policy areas. Democracy should be our first policy area. I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. Um, yeah. Hi. So your last point um, reminded me that you have a book on democracy in the digital age, and I was wondering if you could just connect those issues up and Absolutely. elaborate a bit on that new book. Sure. Thank you for your question. Um, so um, this is a super important point. Um, and it relates to this issue of what is the work that we, the people, need to do to rebuild our institutions. So we are generally experiencing like a pretty unpleasant phenomenon of like massive polarization or tribalism or my favorite word, factionalism. Okay, that's like the old fashioned word <laughs> from this period. And um, the folks who designed the Constitution were worried about faction. They considered it one of the greatest dangers to the long-term health of any given democracy. They thought they devised solutions, and Madison articulates his view of the solution in Federalist 10, 10th Federalist paper, right? And we, we all know that paper, but it actually had, the solution had two parts. We tend to focus on one part. So that's the paper in which he argues that representation is the solution to factionalism. The idea is that people's opinions will be filtered through representatives who are moderating and synthesize views and you can get a kind of common good outlook. But as I said, that was only half of his argument. The other half of his argument was that the thing that would make representation work was geographic dispersal. Okay, literally like the physical extent of the country and the fact that it's sort of divided up by mountains and rivers and things like that. The result of that geographic dispersal was that it would be very hard for people with extreme opinions to find each other and coordinate. <laughs> exactly. You could only go through a representative, all right? So social media has actually disappeared one of the founding pillars of our representational system. Okay, so the premise was geographic dispersal would make representation work. It would be a forcing factor that would lead to the effective operations of our system of representation. All right, it's gone. It's just gone. So that means if we want representation to work again, we actually have to rethink the design of the institutions in a really fundamental way. So that's just one example of how the sort of digital universe is affecting politics in our present age. Um, but it, I, I do put a lot of weight on what social media has created um, with regard to the sort of dysfunction of our contemporary politics. Um, and so thinking about, you know, what's the right kind of public interest mandate for social media platforms, um, but then also more importantly for me, how do we think about the relationship of that to representation as such? That seems to me where we have to do the work. So. We have time for one more question. Right here. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Um, I'm curious if going sort of back to the close reading at the very end, whether safety and happiness would have been seen as at odds at the time, kind of going back to contemporary concerns. We're thinking a little bit, you know, with sort of war on terror, surveillance, et cetera. I think yeah. there is now sometimes talk, at least political rhetoric, about trade-offs between those two? Mm -hmm. no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that's where the hard work of politics is. So in some sense, safety and happiness are not fancy concepts. Um, and they're an English translation of the Roman idea that the purpose of politics was salus populi, the health and well-being of the people. It's their, the preamble to the Constitution, which invokes welfare, is the same concept, basically. Um, and you know, they're sort of captured by very basic ideas like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
argued that you could tell whether a society is prospering according to whether its population was growing. It was like that simple to know whether or not things were going well or not for a society. So there's a kind of broad concept of well-being um, for people that's intended here. Um, and then, yes, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, the sort of people has to debate over time um, which exact sort of calculations around trade-offs count as achieving well-being. So I don't think it's a sort of, um, it's not a problem there's a tension between safety and liberty. Um, what is a problem is when a people is no longer in a position to debate that and achieve compromises. That's when you have a problem. Um, but to be able to, to, to cho choose a trade-off and to expect to adjust over time, that's the sort of necessary work of democratic politics. Terrific. Uh, Dania, we'll be, we will be selling books, uh, copies of your book on the Declaration, right next door in 113, and Dania will be signing books, so you can come by and chat with her. But please join me in thanking Daniel Allen for a terrific Thank conversation. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.